Now we want to look at the wave functions for the rigid rotor. So we have our Schrodinger equation, h psi equals e psi, which we're going to solve for the wave function psi. In this case is a function of the spherical polar coordinates theta and phi, theta going from 0 to pi inclusively, and phi is going to be anywhere between 0 and less than 2 pi. So as soon as you get to 2 pi, then phi goes back to 0 again. And we already saw from our previous videos that the energy levels we're going to get back out of this are going to depend on some quantum number j, and they equal h bar squared over 2 times the moment of inertia times j times j plus 1, where the moment of inertia was mu l squared, the bond length squared times reduced mass of these two atoms, and reduced mass is the product of the masses divided by their sum. And our Hamiltonian <coughs> is just the kinetic energy, there is no potential energy, kinetic energy expressed in spherical polar coordinates for our Laplacian operator. Um, and the part that depends on R has been removed because we have a fixed R, thus the rigid part of our rigid rotor. And it's this uh, rather gargantuan operator here depending on uh, sine of theta and various partial derivatives of theta and phi. So as in most cases, we'll assume some separation of variables where psi of theta and phi is going to equal some function of theta. This is going to be my terrible attempt at a capital theta. Some theta of theta and some capital phi, which is a function of phi. So the standard procedure that we use in this case is separation of variables. So just for the sake of not being completely black box, I'll write out what we get when we do separation of variables. We get that sine theta over big theta times, and then it becomes an ordinary derivative of theta, this one here, times sine of theta d big theta with respect to the variable theta plus 2i e over h bar squared times sine squared theta. <clears throat> and this all equals some constant, which we could perhaps call m squared if we wanted to. Reasons may be seen later why. And we also have for phi, 1 over phi, the function of phi, times the second derivative of phi with respect to the variable phi is equal to minus that same function there. So separation of variables gave us this result that these both have to be equal to the same constant and then we'll solve these individually. And then again important to note <clears throat> the fact that uh, phi of phi plus 2 pi is just equal to phi of phi again. It's a it's a repeating boundary condition. It's a uh, periodic function. Okay, then if we solve these two, which we're not going to, because <clears throat> we could go through this one, but I'll just go ahead and spoil the result, that phi of phi is going to be equal to normalization constant of 1 over square root of 2 pi of e to the i m phi. <clears throat> so this is a complex exponential, as it has a square root of minus 1 in there, and it has a quantum number m, so we might write phi m of phi. And this m has values which look like 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, etc. <clears throat> and this normalization constant of 2 pi, you might guess, comes from the fact that this function is periodic over the region of 2 pi. And you would be correct. Then what about the, <clears throat> the more complicated situation here, where we have, uh, looks like a second derivative term, plus a term of the sine of squared of theta, and a constant, uh, that's a much more involved equation to solve and ends up giving something called the Legendre equation. And the solutions of this end up becoming theta, let me draw my big theta more consistently like I have been. That theta, which is going to depend on this same quantum number j and this new quantum number we have down here from phi m and that's a function of the variable theta, the polar angle, equals, 
a big normalization constant, which is 2j plus 1 over 2 times j minus the absolute value of m factorial over j plus the absolute value of m factorial. So that's all a big normalization constant. And then times this function p absolute value of mj. And the variable in this function is cosine theta. So let's discuss this more fully here. So this whole big thing here is just a normalization constant. We're familiar with those. Those just ensure that the integral of theta star theta over the entire range of theta, which is 0 to pi, that for any value of j and m, that this is going to give us 1, that the, <clears throat> the function is normalized over the entire range of theta, that the probability of the particle having some value of theta would be 1. And this other function here, this part which we have not encountered before, this is called the associated Legendre function. <clears throat> so you might have heard of Legendre polynomials before. They're things that come up for a lot of problems that involve spherical symmetry, like the rigid rotor. And these associated Legendre functions are closely related to the regular Legendre polynomials, but for now, let's just say these exist and there's a value of them which you can look up in a table for a given value of j and absolute value of m. I suggest you uh, consult your textbook or other places on the internet <coughs> for how to generate these functions. If you look up uh, spherical harmonics and things like that, you'll more than likely find many resources that will help you out there. Okay, so our total wave function then is going to end up being our psi of theta and phi, which is often written as this kind of y of jm theta of phi, which this is really written this way because these uh, are end up co being called the spherical harmonic functions, is a product of just this theta and theta and phi of phi. As we said, so I'll mark down that these are called spherical harmonics. They come up a lot in problems of spherical symmetry. It's an important term that you may hear quite a lot. And the value of these are going to look something like our YLM of theta and phi are going to equal this little pre-factor here, which you may or may not see, depending on your source. I'm going to put it just in case your source has it. And then a big normalization constant of 2j plus 1 over 4 pi, multiplying this normalization constant and that normalization constant for the total normalization constant, times j minus absolute value of m factorial over j plus absolute value of m factorial. And then we have the associated Legendre function for the value of j and absolute value of m of cosine theta. Cosine theta is the value you put into the polynomial here, generally shown as a function of x. Your x in this case is cosine theta. So the, var the variable here is not theta, it is cosine theta that you feed into this polynomial. So you're going to get things that are polynomials of cosine theta, like cosine squared, cosine cubed, etc. And then our last little bit in there, e to the i m phi, from our function of phi right there. <clears throat> okay, so that's the spherical harmonics in their full detail, in their full glory. They've got this very large normalization constant, they've got this polynomial, and they've got a complex exponential. So what do these all look like in practice? So if we pick y0,0, <clears throat> that's just a constant function, 1 over 4 pi. It's the same everywhere in space, it's just normalized to be 1 over an entire unit sphere. And then if we look at j equals 1, m equals 0, sometimes j is also called l, so if you ever see j or l 
in this type of function or in the spherical harmonics. That's just the same thing. Some people use J, some people use L. I'm just going to use J. Um, <clears throat> then for J equals 1, M equals 0, we'd have 3 over 4 pi times cosine of theta. So the Legendre, the associated Legendre function P of 1, 0 would equal X. So P of 1, 0 of cosine theta is just cosine theta. And then the case for Y, 1 plus or minus 1, pl pick which one you want for the specific case. They're the same to within a sign factor. That's minus plus, so if it's plus, it's minus, if it's minus, it's plus. Square root of same constant 3 over 4 pi. Then sine of theta, and m equals 1, because I have an m value of 1 up here, or minus 1. So that's e to the plus or minus i phi. Then y of 2, 0 becomes square root of 5 over 16 pi and then 3 cosine squared theta minus 1 so the Legendre polynomial for P of 2 0 is 3 X squared minus 1 so we get 3 cosine squared minus 1 and then Y 2 for plus or minus 1 it's going to be minus plus, again, switch the sign, 15 over 8 pi sine theta times cosine theta e to the plus or minus i phi. And lastly, we'll have y2 plus or minus 2 it's going to equal square root of 15 over 32 pi sine squared theta e to the plus or minus 2i phi. So you see how it comes into play. Whenever we have a non-zero value of m, you get this complex exponential factor tacked on there. Uh, you have some polynomial of cosine theta, which pops out in either cosine or sine theta and a normalization constant that that falls on just based off of what the value of j and m are so that's that's what they are um, you can usually find these uh, tabulated in various places uh, you won't be expected to memorize these I hope so just uh, look them up in whatever table plug in the values of j and m you need depending on what it is and we're going to discuss more fully things like uh, expectation values and operators and eigenvalues for these functions and what kind of useful things you can determine based on that.